Okay, well, welcome everybody to the latest installment of Industrial Marketing Live. We have got um, some friendly faces. I will just say, as we get things kicked off, this is our third one of the year. Um, really, really excited to see some familiar faces popping on. Bruce, hey, Aaron, hey. Let's see, okay, yeah, and I'm gonna keep hitting admit as I get us in our started off here. Um, I'm Peyton Warren from Gorilla 76. And just as a reminder, before we jump into things, this whole conversation today is really meant to be a, um, a conversation, a collaboration. And if we feel the urge, maybe even some workshopping, like figuring out how you um, execute some of the things we're talking about in your own worlds. So uh, we definitely welcome folks to unmute. Uh, in the beginning, we like to talk a little bit about a particular topic. Today, it's gonna be paid social. Um, but then at the end, we'll open it up for Q and A. Um, like I said, workshopping, whatever we need to do. Um, so today, joining Matt and I, we've got Blake Strozik. Is that how you pronounce it, Blake? Yeah, I got it right, nice. Awesome, awesome. Blake's from Re Refine Labs and Blake is just the best guest we could possibly have on today because Blake has managed lots and lots of paid social campaigns. What was it, two million a month? And I wish a month, maybe I was at like, one point. I was like, whoa, yeah. that's like insane. Like, how do you even <laughs> keep it straight? So it's a year, right? Yeah, two million yep. a year about um, uh, in paid social campaigns for lots of different companies. Um, which, like I said, is perfect because today we're going to talk about paid social. Um, so just super excited. Thanks for joining Blake. And we're really excited to hear your take and anywhere you disagree with Matt. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, no. Happy to be here and excited to chat it up today. Yeah, awesome. actually, the real reason, I, one of the real, real reasons I wanted to bring Blake on was obviously he does a lot of, you know, more money per month, but he g cut his teeth not even 18 months ago doing much lower budget campaigns. And so I thought Blake would be an awesome sort of window into like, hey, you know, like, yes, I manage all these huge campaigns and I'm doing five, five figures a month, mid five figures a month easily. But here's how you can extrapolate that down to like, if you got a few grand to work with a month, here's how you can get the most squeeze out of that. So that's one reason I wanted to bring Blake on is because he has that perspective doing smaller budgets and he's applied, being able to apply some of that in larger budgets and seeing what applies and what doesn't and can bring that perspective for you all. Awesome. Yeah. So I, just to kick us off, let's just get started. Um, Matt, I wanted to kick it over to you and just kind of set the stage. Like what is paid social good for? How do we even know if it's the right fit for, you know, our company with all the social channels out there? Like, where do you even start? All right. So I'll, uh, I'll start by saying that what is paid social good for? It's good for guaranteed distribution of content to your audience uh, in a way that you cannot accomplish using other platforms. So uh, I would say like a lot of people will do, a, a lot of people will predispose themselves to doing PPC, uh, uh, paid search, because they want to do things around keywords and they want to try to get people to their website and they want to try to get them to convert. It's very performance marketing. It's very capture demand oriented. Um, but paid social is actually where you get people to want to work with you as a company. Um, and you get to build, um, you get to build familiarity with your audience, with what you do and who you do it for. And some of the use cases where people have used it successfully. And I think one of the other things about paid social that I love, uh, vis-a-vis -vis paid search, let's say, is the content flexibility that you have. You have the chance to present things about your product or your use cases, or even your point of view on the market in a way that you really can't do with, with, paid, with, with paid search, where you basically are trying to write the most compelling headline one, headline two, and description with a call to action behind it. So uh, for me, paid social is great for guaranteeing distribution to your audience um, and making sure you get in front of the right job <laughs> titles and the right companies all the time. So that's, that to me is why I'm a big advocate for it. Um, there's smart ways to do it with low budgets. Uh, not everyone here is going to be blessed with, you know, five figure a month budgets. And I'm, I'm well aware of that. And so really what we want to talk about are strategies and approaches to doing this effectively when you're spending, you know, three, four grand a month on paid social and how you can get the most out of that. Uh, Blake, you, what do you want to, you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, like, when you're thinking of, like, paid social versus, like, paid search or PPC, right? It's, like, paid social, there's so much more upside. And we're not, like, how I kind of view it is you don't need, like, just one or the other. It's both working in harmony. But, mm-hmm. like, as you kind of said, like, paid search is, like, those are people that are already looking for your product or service. And so it's, like, there's only a finite amount of those people. But, like, on paid social, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you can just define, like, hey, who's my whole market that I'm going after? And like you said, you can guarantee putting content in their feed where you can communicate like a valuable story about your product, service, the problem that it solves, the business case, the business problems that it solves, the ROI, all those different things. Like you can control that and you have like that direct channel through paid social. Right on. And I think like a a lot of people will, I've heard this a lot even from when I was in-house working in the welding industry, but people would go like, if only everyone knew all the things we could do for them. Well, guess what? Paid social is kind of the medium by which you can show all the people, all the things you can do for them. I, I can't tell you how many times like my key accounts team or my sales team, or even my president would go, gosh, if only John Deere knew all the stuff that, that we were, that we could do for them in their plan. Well, you know, you can use something like LinkedIn and do exactly that for yourself because you're going to have guaranteed distribution. You'll have reach in a way that you won't have with your sponsored page. And, uh, and it's just, it's just a way for you to present that information better. I would say, you know, we'll we'll probably get into the kind of organic versus paid aspect of it sometime during this conversation. I have my thoughts on that, but for me, that's, that's the magic and the best way to utilize paid social for yourself. I feel like paid social to so many folks is, is just Facebook and LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of people get trapped in like the, maybe LinkedIn's the play because this is business um, advertising. We're doing business to business. So should we only use LinkedIn? Um, but something that I've seen time and time again is how powerful Facebook can be. Can you, can you all talk a little bit more about like yeah. what channel? All right, I'll, I'll start Blake and you can okay. pick it. I'm going to, I'm going to do a hard truth here. This is like opinions versus reality almost. So Reality is your customers are on Facebook and are there to be had. Um, opinion that I hear a lot is our our buyers are not on Facebook, but they they certainly are. Um, you can target by certain job titles if you want to. But I think for a lot of people in B2B manufacturing, it's difficult to target the right audiences on Facebook. And so it's not going to be the platform for everybody unless you have the appetite to do certain sort of audience development, layering um, degrees and in, in industries and stuff like that, if you can. But normally on Facebook, like you want to do the job title, if you can, and, and max that out entirely. I think one of the reasons why a lot of people are suspicious of Facebook, let's say, is it doesn't give you the kind of demographic data that you get on LinkedIn. So the reason why most people will gravitate towards LinkedIn is because They'll run the ad, they'll have this job title and this industry, and they can even target by the company. And then they're running uh, they're running content towards those people. And then LinkedIn's got that great demographics data feature where you can look at all the companies that you're delivering in front of, all the job titles you're delivering in front of, all the functions, all the geographic areas. And that tends to give your executive team a lot of confidence when you're doing this, that, hey, we're on the right track here because look at who I'm hitting here. Does this look like the people we want to sell to? Yes. And so that tends to give you more leash. Whereas on Facebook, that data is a lot more opaque. And so you have to have confidence in your targeting. And then you have to use things like um, custom events to track that um, on Facebook. But even still, you're looking at literally just an event. You're not getting necessarily like pulling real data out of it. And then using things like self-reported attribution to ask like, how did you first hear about us? Or, or, or how did you find out about us? And then you know, you're, you're, you're making the bet, all things you do in life when you're doing B2B is, is an educated bet that people will say Facebook was the way by which they found you. And the other thing is simply just correlating it, right? Like, hey, we're spending this much on ads and we're using this channel primarily and our inbound pipeline is going like this. So what, what should and can we attribute to that? So a lot of it isn't necessarily like the cleanest attribution out there, but you're definitely looking at a lot of different things that are happening within your CRM and then basically putting those puzzle pieces together to tell the story of like, what is, what is this program doing and and how am I measuring the effectiveness of it? There's like so many good nuggets in there, but like, I think like what you like touched on, like the attribution side, like that's super tough, right? Cause like, so for context, so I work at Refine Labs. You all may have seen us on LinkedIn. You know, we work with B2B SaaS companies. We have a really like prolific 
a CEO who creates great content. Um, but basically, you know, when we're working with clients, like right now I work with four series A through C high growth startups and, you know, we execute their paid media mix. And so we're using, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, those different channels. Well, so even, you know, with, you know, a deeper targeting tool that we use for Facebook, so we can kind of get that LinkedIn level targeting on Facebook, even with that attribution is still difficult, right? And I think like to be able to really measure the success of your program, and I saw a question in there, so I might be jumping ahead, but um, really, you know, it all starts with like alignment of the overall strategy when you're looking at your channels to use. Because as Matt said, like you need to figure out where your people, like your target audience is, your total addressable market, where are they at, and then where can you communicate with them? But I think when you're measuring success, like using channels like this, it all starts with what's the goal of marketing, right? And so the way that we view it and the way that we're communicating it to like clients and how I think a lot of people on here probably think is that, you know, marketing's goal is to bring qualified buyers to the website to talk to the sales team. And the reason like that we align on that goal and use those, you know, uh, platforms to do that is because that's the most efficient and scalable way to hit recurring growth goals over time, right? Because you can drive more people to the website by educating more people in your market to come to you. So kind of like related to the Facebook, Facebook versus LinkedIn, I think when you're looking at like the channel level split, it's really important to just kind of view like your total blended, you know, spend on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and kind of like measuring all of that against what your website's bringing in. Because sure you want like direct, you know, as direct attribution as you can get. And as Matt said, like that self-report attribution is key. But at the end of the day, it's like you're using like a variety of different um, signals, but there's no clear cut like, okay, they saw this Facebook ad and they saw this on LinkedIn and then they came inbound. Like it's, it's B2B buying journeys are complex. There's, you know, you have to like sell it internally. There's a lot of different things that have to happen. So I think it's like, you know, when you're looking at the different channels like that, you kind of have to consider the whole picture when you're looking at where to allocate. Yeah, I think you have to also remember it's, first off, it's nonlinear, like we said yep. about the buyer's journey. And the other aspect of it is, um, is like, it's, it's, uh, I was, I just lost my train of thought here, <laughs> thought here a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to measure because of privacy, like, like privacy regulations from social media platforms are not going away and they're only going to get harder. And you can't just discount a channel because it's so because it's it's too hard to measure it because you're just cheating yourself out of where your audience potentially is. And so, you know, for you, you have to figure out qualitative ways to show efficacy in the program. Um, but honestly, you can't just discount a channel because attribution on it's so hard. I mean, you look at the ways that people buy stuff. Like, I'll give you a perfect example for me as a consumer. I bought my dad masterclass for Christmas this past year. Um, Newsflash, never buy your parents uh, a, an app. It's a horrible idea because installing <laughs> it was a huge pain. But I basically was getting fed masterclass video ads on Facebook for, oh, about six to eight months before I thought it's a great idea for my dad because I saw all these Daniel and the Granu poker things. My dad's big into poker. And I basically didn't click through Masterclass whatsoever to go through Facebook and do it. I went to masterclass.com on my computer. I got all these ads on my phone. I went to Masterclass on my desktop and I bought it. And then they, I mean, if, if, if they didn't have self-report attribution, it would have said website direct is exactly how I came to buy them. But they asked how, how did I hear about them? And I was like, Facebook ads, like I got Facebook ad after Facebook ad after Facebook ad from them. And that's why I decided to buy. So if you're not going to put like attribution, self-report attribution in your, um, you know, in your, you know, in your form, in your form field to track it, you know, look at like, just think about how you buy stuff and how you get educated on products before you buy it as a consumer and people who buy in B2B do it very similarly is really, in my opinion, there's not a huge difference anymore because of the, how the internet's level the playing field in a lot of ways. And I think that's why you can't discount paid social for yourself as a, as a distribution channel for your content and to reach your customers. Yeah. I think that Aaron in the chat, you, you even said it, uh, Aaron Weeks, you said it really well. It was like, there's a difference between where my buyer, where are my buyers and what channel my buyers are in. So just like you said, Matt, you can't discount those channels because people are there. There are millions of users yeah. um, on Facebook. So uh, it's not just LinkedIn. 
So I want to I want to give a question out to Blake first off here, and then we, we can we can roll in. But I want to talk a little bit. We're talking very conceptually about paid social, and I wonder if we want to get into the nuts and bolts of it at all, which I think would be would be fun to talk through because Blake deals with a lot of different different clients, and I'm, I'm curious a little bit about how you guys structure some of your your ad accounts uh, in terms of like you know objectives and conversions and things like that. Um, if you want to if you want to want to dive in there a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So I guess like, you know, so we already kind of talked about like, you got to have your strategy set. So let's assume like the strategy is set. We want to educate people in our target audience to come to our website and want to talk to our sales team because it's scalable and efficient. So like with that kind of caveat out of the way, um, really how, <clears throat> excuse me, really how we look at it is, yeah, we'll look at, you know, the target audience of a client, right? And say, okay, where is where are your target customers hanging out online? And typically we'll start with, yeah, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so now we say, okay, now we know, let's start with those channels. So typically the best way to get started, at least for B2B that I've seen, um, for Facebook, probably the easiest thing to start with is just simple retargeting. I mean, you could try like the native, you know, um, interest targeting, demographics, different things like that. But I think if you're looking for like proof of concept and like, you know, will this work? I would start with retargeting on Facebook and then start like doing some targeting on LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn, yeah, it's more expensive. Like the CPMs, I was looking at an account the other day, it's like 11 bucks on Facebook, it's $70 on LinkedIn. So it's like 7X for the exact same audience. So like we're targeting cool. the exact same people. But when you look at, you know, again, when you're measuring your total ad spend against your actual marketing funnel, so marketing source demos, ops, pipeline, and closed one revenue, that's when you can kind of like build a business case like okay this makes sense to spend that if we see this number going up or down like that's kind of how you can read that out but like tactically looking at like linkedin it's got to start with like the targeting right especially if you're on a limited budget you can't just go after whoever you want you have to have a really tight targeting approach so basically like a couple of like um, methods that we'll use if you have a really low budget you want to reach you know, the decision makers at your target accounts. So if like, if you have a target account list, definitely start there oh, with some different like job title targeting of like the decision makers. So whether that's, you know, I don't know what some titles for you guys might be, but maybe like, you know, your VP of engineering or something like that. Yeah, op operations director or something. Okay. something. There you go. Yeah, so start with like those decision maker job titles, operations director, and then you have a target account list, operations director, and like that would be like the the best place to start. So I'll pause there, Matt. I don't know. Is that where you guys will typically start? Yeah. So I think for us, it depends on the. It always depends on the use case and on the client and on like you know just how niche down are they versus how general are they. So the larger your, I think the larger your total adjustable market, the more inclined I am to go with the job title slash industry layer layer feature. And then I'm trying to do like multiples of those if I had the budget. If not, I'm going to make a bet on two and kind of run them against each other. If it's uh, a really focused niche down sort of industry, like we have one where I do, uh, they sell window machinery, like window manufacturing machinery. That's, a, that's like, I mean, you're you're looking at companies that have construction or building materials or, you know, metals and mining as industry disciplines. And then, you know, not every production manager or engineering manager is going to apply. You can really have poor targeting at that point. So one of the things that I like to do with that is just get an account list. So, I mean, it's a lot of dirty work, but like you're doing a lot of Google searches to find the top window, the window and door manufacturers in the United States and Canada. And you're creating a, an Excel sheet to basically throw them into LinkedIn. And then I get that sort of audience and then I'm layering job function on top of it. So I'll get an account list and it'll get be a certain size. And it's like, all right, we're going to layer operations and engineering disciplines on top of that. And then I want to make sure that they have X years experience. And then, you know, I come up with a list of, you know, it's a 32,000 person audience. And I'm like, perfect. That four grand a month, that's, that's a good size. Let's run that. Um, and then I'm looking at, am I hitting the right titles? At that point, what you're doing is once you start running campaigns, you're in, on LinkedIn, at least you're looking at the demographic data and then you're starting to weed out job titles you see that you don't like. So I want to exclude the sales engineer. I want to exclude anyone in district sales. I want to exclude um, executive administrative assistant or something like that. I don't want to ignore some of the other potential influencers necessarily. I don't, I don't want to get rid of like maintenance technicians or something like that. To me, that actually has merit to target to those people. But I definitely want to get out of people who I know have no in 
to the uh, to the CEO or, or the or the buying or the, the person who makes the buying decision whatsoever. So usually I start with an account list and I'll layer job functions on top of it. And then once I have efficacy there, then I'm starting to see how I can expand that audience a little bit more. So I'll look at things like an industrial, you got to do this because it's kind of it's a little bit weird. So I was looking at member groups. Um, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at certain skills and cer certain member skills like window and doors is a member skill. And, and I was like, perfect. I can layer that member skill on top of a discipline and and let's run to that. So, you know, for you, I mean, LinkedIn has so many targeting criteria at your disposal. It can be overwhelming, but think about it almost write it out on like a whiteboard for yourself or like a piece of paper before you start building it in the platform to have an idea of what you want to do. But like you said, Blake, like knowing your, knowing your target market intimately saves you from making a lot of bad mistakes. So like we, uh, I, this has happened to me before where I was targeting people who were in, um, who were firefighters and we were targeting firefighters to uh, sell spectrometers to them. And then I realized like kind of like a month or so into running the campaign, we can get to this point as well, but like, you know, it's not really firefighters that I'm targeting it's firefighters who are in hazmat units. And so I had to further segment yeah, them layer. down by having hazmat hazmat as a skill set, And then that cut my already audience by like 60%, but you know what, it was a much tighter audience and it did, and it's done much better since I did that. Yeah. And I think kind of like on that note, just like when we're like thinking about audiences, I like your idea of like the whiteboard exercise. So I can like share like two recent examples, right? So like kind of polar opposites. So when you're looking at like audience size, like say you're building your audience out on LinkedIn, like this is always a tricky one, right? Because it's like, okay, how big is too big or how small is too small? Yes, it's, and, it's, a, it's a huge question for people. Right? Yeah, so it's, it's tough, right? And it's like, there's not necessarily a silver bullet, but here's like a kind of a method that I've used in the past with success. So for one client, the, they were selling to restaurants and this is in the UK. So they're selling to restaurants. So basically, kind of how I approach getting an audience estimate is, you know, I looked up, you know, from some different data sources of how many restaurants are in the UK. And so there, I think there was like 100,000 or something, 123, whatever it was. And then I looked at, okay, you know, probably 60% of these, there's like one decision maker that we could really target. So that's like 60,000 people. And the other 40, 60,000, there might be a couple decision makers. So like, I just kind of like mapped out, okay, basically from my rough estimates, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's going to get you close. There's probably between three to 500,000 people okay. that this message is relevant to. And so like, that's like, I think a really good exercise. Cause on the other end of the spectrum, there's this other client mm -hmm. we were working with where they sold like a really, um, you know, a marketing technology that had like really no stringent problem. requirements. You. So you had to spend a certain amount of money per month on uh, paid ads. You had to use Salesforce as your CRM has these different requirements. And so for them, it wouldn't make sense for a three to 500,000 person audience, right? There's not that many people that could sell, you know, that they could sell to that have those requirements or that uh, meet that criteria. So for them, like a good audience size was like 50,000 or whatever it was. So I think like that's a really valuable exercise, especially when you're getting started. And like you said, Matt, like there's so many different options, but I think keeping it simple, account list or job titles plus industry plus company size, Keep it super simple at first. And then like you said, Matt, with your hazmat example, then you can always kind of like um, tighten the screws there, so to speak. Yeah, I think one one key point that I made and you made and that anyone here who's doing marketing for their company like should, should know, um, you have to know your market segments like well. It's like the, the biggest death knell you can do is, is not intimately know who you are supposed to be selling to. Um, which is something that because marketers don't have a lot of access to customers can be difficult. So, you know, getting yourself in there to, you know, talk with your sales team, talk with your product team, meet with customers, get a customer feedback loop will really help you understand more who you're targeting to. Um, because it, the easiest thing to do is to make a lot of assumptions, not cross check them with people in your company. Uh, and then find yourself having an audience that is way off target of what you're supposed to, who you're supposed to be pursuing and why. So we've got a couple questions in the chat, I think that are kind of tied at audience. So want to bring these up. Um, the, the most recent is we're, we're talking about size is, um, yeah, is a, is a LinkedIn audience over 1 million too big, even if targets, uh, even, even if it targets your key industries, um, that's from Jeremy and job titles. And we have another one on job titles about, you know, if we're seeing mid-level engineers on LinkedIn or are they on other platforms as well? Like you want to, do you want to 
go first on the one yeah. million? I, I figure you probably have a better answer on this than I do, but I have my thoughts on it too. No, you're good. I'll take a crack at it. Um, so for Jeremy's question, like, is a LinkedIn audience of over one million too big? Um, I hate to give the classic consultant answer, but it does depend, right? So it's like, <laughs> it, it's got to have like, for example, like just going back to software because that's what I know. But it's like, you know, if you're selling a project management tool or if you're selling Zoom, like you've got, you could target anybody. You could have a huge audience. But so for this example, um, I would look at talk to your sales team and say, you know, hey, who are you guys targeting, or who, you know, what are you guys looking at when you're, um, you know, going out and like calling people? Because I think your sales team has probably done a lot of this legwork too, or hopefully they have. But I would say talk to them, see what kind of like list or database that they're going off of, and then kind of compare that to your LinkedIn audience size. That'd be my like simple step one that I think should be a slam dunk. What do you think, Matt? I would say if you have an audience size of 1 million, you probably have about five to eight separate audiences you could run concurrently or try against. So if you have an audience size of 1 million, you should definitely be segmenting it by number of employees yeah. or revenue or um, years experience, or so you, they should be able to segment further down than industry and job title to get more specific. Um, and that's what I would recommend doing. So if you, let's say that your audience, let's say your company can sell to ev everywhere from small business all the way up to enterprise. Well, you should at the very least then start to segment out by, by those three sort of tiers of customer. And then at that point, you could also segment out further by um, maybe different maybe different job titles within it. So let's say you're targeting operations and product and engineering. Well, they, they could all be different audiences and you could tailor your messaging and your landing page experience a little bit to each of them. I don't know your budget, Jeremy, and I don't know if you have enough to, to cater to that. And frankly, that's a lot of ad, that's a lot of ad inventory to manage. I'll be quite frank with you, but I would be thinking about how I can segment down even more to get a tighter audience. So my message can be tighter to that audience. And then I can create a bit of a custom content distribution strategy for each of them. And I think I'm just going to piggyback one thing off there. I think like a really good key one that I've really realized has helped is so LinkedIn is going to give you your different company sizes that you can choose from. And I almost always, unless the, unless the customer specifically has success in the 10,000 and above, I cut that out because you get a lot, a lot of waste in there, right? Yeah. So unless you're like specifically targeting that, I would almost always cut that out, especially on the million size. I think you could like trim down probably a lot based on your target, but I totally agree. It's a slam dunk approach, Matt. Yeah, I say one more thing It also is like audience is one thing, but reach is a whole other one. So LinkedIn's gonna give you this audience size of a million, but when you actually start running content to your audience, you're probably only going to reach somewhere between 20 and 40% of that actual audience because those are that's the steps, the number that's actually active on LinkedIn. So when you build yourself that audience and you think it looks awesome, you know, it's great, but the real metric that you're going to look at when you're looking at your dashboard on LinkedIn is your reach. And your reach is actually how many people you're really reaching on LinkedIn, um, not necessarily your audience. So if you have an audience size of a million, you're probably only going to hit, you know, 150 to 350,000, I would say, I think would be a safe bet if you have enough budget to even reach all of them. So Matt, you, you mentioned reach is something that you look at, um, Aaron had a question in the chat from the very beginning of the call. Um, should success of paid social be measured purely by revenue or pipeline? What other metrics do you look at? Sounds like reach. I I'm just thinking back to like, okay, we're getting started. Like what, what should our dashboard even look like? Like what are the numbers we should even be tracking um, when you're setting that up in LinkedIn for the first time? So that way you can sure. tell the story to your leadership on like, Hey, this is, this is working. Don't freak out. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm going to have thoughts on this that may differ a little bit from the ethos of, of Refine Labs, but I do think you can run um, paid social campaigns with the with the objective of driving newsletter subscriptions or, or, or webinar registrations, or even if you have a really good organic content strategy behind it, something like white paper or ebook downloads. It really, the objective of your paid social is important but also like you have to have a plan on the back end of it for yourself. And really that's where a lot of people who run straight performance marketing lead gen fall flat is they basically will run a white paper or an ebook download to immediately have their inside salesperson reach out and bother them with a, with a ton of crappy emails or, you know, pester them with phone calls with really lame pitches. If you're going to do, uh, if you're going to do more of a lead gen approach, I mean, you need to think about your larger content strategy overall and how you're going to keep that audience engaged 
um, figure out what mediums you're going to use, and then have a longer time horizon as well for those people to convert to a customer. Because people who are going to come to you and say they heard from you from paid social, if you're doing straight content distribution, are probably going to be ready to buy from you much faster because you're optimizing for that high intent conversion. Whereas when you're doing a low intent conversion, like an ebook download, they're not ready to buy them. They're literally just browsing for information and you should have a longer time horizon for when you would expect them to become a customer. And you should also know you still have a lot more work to do to get them to that point. So, I mean, when that happens, give yourself, you know, something more representative of your sales cycle um, in order to, to keep them with another, with a, with an organic content strategy through email or webinars or something like this. Um, whereas if you're going to straight content distribution, product marketing, case studies, problem awareness blogs that uh, I certainly like to champion, when they come, they're going to come in through the quote request or the pricing page, and they're going to basically be ready to talk to your salesperson about a solution for them. Yeah, and I, I think I'd like, so that, that's, that's, not, that's not too far off, Matt, I would say. I, okay. mean, I, I agree with like the content play in the webinars. No, I think you're uh, close to on base there, but um, really how... You know, it's tough, right? Because, I mean, I remember when I was in-house, I reported directly to our CEO. And, like, I had to manage our marketing spend. And, like, we had to say, like, hey, what's what's the investment that these dollars are putting on us, you know, through digital, through trade shows, the different things that we had to do. And, um, you know, and we still present that all the time. Like, the clients I work with, we present the same thing. So, recently, and this isn't fully fleshed out, but this has been helpful for me of how I've thought of it, is thinking of like three separate funnels almost right with not not trying to overcomplicate it but like you've got your like awareness funnel as like funnel one where it's like i'm using paid social in a like i'm using these paid media dollars in awareness channels to give out this content to my target audience and so like that has its own set of metrics and so like what we'll typically look for there is like are they engaging with the content? Are they commenting? Are they liking? Are they clicking through to the content and going onto your website and reading it? We'll look in Google Analytics, you know, and set up like a scroll depth trigger and say, hey, have they scrolled 50% of the way of the page? All those signals that, you know, tell us on the other side of the ad platform, like, hey, these people are consuming this content, again, with the ultimate goal that they are going to come back through our website. So it's like your, your awareness funnel, and then it's like your, like, kind of capture demand funnel where it's like people are coming through high intent channels. So for most of you all, that would be Google and then potentially Bing. And so coming through those high intent channels and converting there, that's got its own different metrics like cost per conversion. And you have your kind of like leading metrics there as well. And then like looking at like the business funnel, right? Where it's like, that's where you're looking at, okay, how many total inbound requests that I have? How many of those became a opportunity? What's the pipeline you know, amount associated with each of those? And ultimately, how many of those did we close? So when, when I think about it like that, I feel like framing it up that way where it's like, this is the objective of paid social. And, you know, we're looking for engagement there, but we're tracking it all along the way. I found that to be helpful. So I don't know if that's like a kind of a helpful way for someone to look at it, but it's been helping me lately. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't think there's anything wrong with running paid social with the objective of it to not be revenue. But I don't think that should be the primary reason you do it. It should be. Uh, a smaller part of it. Like, because, you know, most people today are not going to like stay glued to a certain company's content all the time because people today right now are gravitating towards individuals anyway. I mean, think about people like Joe for Gorilla or Chris for Refine. You know, they follow those people a lot more than they follow our company page. And it's very much the same kind of with your, even with your own organic content play as well. So if you're going to try to run paid social to get and to acquire an email address, to run them through a newsletter, that you want them to, to, you know, engage with for like nine, 12, 18 months, you know, I, it, you're probably my opinion, better off to just stay in front of them in paid social with content distribution. Although the metrics are going to be, are, are going to take longer for them to, to see, like, you know, you obviously when you're running that kind of performance marketing, you can go tell your CEO or your director of marketing, if you're working under them, like, Hey, we're getting newsletter subscriptions for like, you know, $6 a piece here. This is great. Um, and they may find that to be worth it for you. But I, I, I think a lot of it depends on your, the makeup of your company, how you guys are running content, how what marketing is supposed to be doing in terms of they're supposed to be contributing to pipeline. Are they supposed to be like just kind of giving the sales team leads? I think just having, having alignment with your executive team on like why you're doing paid social and for what purpose will drive a lot of the things you do on paid social and what you're optimizing for. Speaking of aligning with leadership, 
how can you like get them to understand like what the actual expectation should be on results and um, just have like, especially when you're getting started, you don't have any audience. Um, you're, you're just starting to develop the audience. Like when can you even expect that to start producing? Um, I can help with that. Uh, so we were, uh, I was running a campaign for one of our clients. Uh, we started running LinkedIn ads for them at the clip of $4,000 a month. Um, and we had, uh, we did three straight months of doing that ad. We ran it from like March until uh, June. And we had approximately $0 in pipeline that entire quarter. And I was like, oh, shh, this is not going to be good for me. Um, but I, I, did, I told the, uh, the POC, I was like, stay calm. This is natural. We're not doing something where we're trying to acquire email addresses. We're trying to get people who actually know us and want to work with us and, and we're learning about us. It's a process. Um, fast forward next quarter, um, we ended up with I mean, and by the way, I'll say this, like, and I have to say this, like, very loud and clear. This kind of approach only works if you're going to use a blended funnel. If you're going to need direct attribution from every single channel, this will not work because there's just going to be a lot of questions, a lot of doubt, and, and you're basically trying to do, you're basically doing performance marketing and ebook, ebook downloads and stuff like that. So we ran this, uh, so, so we ran the kind of distribution first quarter, we ran it, nothing. Second quarter, 1.6 million in pipeline. Uh, last quarter, $955,000 in pipeline. So far this quarter, we're not even halfway through February, another $1.6 million so far in inbound pipeline. And that's at $4,000 a month in paid social ad spend, plus another $1,500 in, uh, in, in paid search. Non-branded, by the way. We're not actually trying to capture people that are that are uh, doing that, searching that company's name. So um, but the other thing that we did right there was like, we got the targeting right. And so we just kept hitting that targeting over and over and over. And we found the right mix of content. So you have to give it time and you have to measure it the right way in order for it, in order for you to have confidence that it's working. But whenever the client would ask, like, how do I know this is working? It's, I would just say the same thing. Like, what's the, what's the only other, what's the only thing you're doing right now in marketing to get in front of your target audience? Like we're doing doing paid search on Google and we're doing paid content on LinkedIn and we did conversion rate optimization on your website. And, and I can at least track last touch for you. And this is where everything is coming from. I mean, wh where else would it come from for you? So sometimes it's just like, don't get so drunk on what the software tells you, like just apply common sense. Like what are the things programmatically that we're doing from the marketing side to drive a result for the client and just simply correlate that together. Cause it's really not that it's really it's pretty simple when you think about it. Yeah, and I think kind of like to add on to that. So first on like timeline, like typically what we'll say is like two extra sales cycle length. So obviously if you're a high velocity sale, you should see some quicker wins. But if you're a long sale or it's a really long consultative sales process, it could take a little longer. But Matt, I think you kind of hit it straight on the head. And like one thing I'll add on the attribution side, I, I know, you know, talking a lot about it, but it, it's tough, right? Because those are the questions you get from your senior leadership team, the executive team, like, mm -hmm. you know, where is all this coming from? How can you attribute it? So one thing that I see time and time again, like if, you know, if I could probably go into like any of your guys' like HubSpot, if you have that in place or just anything, there's like three main sources you'll see um, attributed for any of the leads. It's organic search, it's direct traffic, and it's branded search. So people looking mm -hmm. up the company name, right? And so I was having a conversation with a client the other day where it's like, our branded search is bringing us $200 conversions. Why aren't we spending more money there? Why are we wasting money on Facebook? And it's it's the whole system together, right? Because it's like we have to generate the demand on those paid social channels so they come in through Google. Google is just the pass through, right? Like we're creating it where they actually are, but where we're where you know it's being captured, it's just in Google, right? And so it's like, and you can't scale that Google search, right? You can't scale branded search. But you can scale putting content in front of people and educating them with case studies, product ads, problem awareness blogs, all different things we've kind of talked about today. So I just thought I'd, I'd um, you know, bring that up because, I mean, it's it's tough, but it's one of those things where if you can get the buy in, you can see some pretty dramatic results like you guys just did with that uh, one client. Yeah, I mean, you need to do something for them to search your company name in the first place. They're not just magically going to think of you, um, you know, and that's why. That's why people here do other stuff too. That's why you're on ThomasNet or on Police One or on some of these like referral kind of websites as well, doing the same kind of stuff. 
The only difference is with paid social, you're essentially getting out of the RFQ process or, you know, basically, or RFI process. And you're essentially getting yourself to the front of the line. And that's what you use paid social for is my, my feeling. And I tell this to most of my clients when we talk about this, it's like, if, if, if they're seeing you through Google, to, like through Google, and it's the only place they found you, then you're one of like three or four companies that they're probably doing the exact same for. Like you want to win their, their mind and you want to win their heart if you can do that before they ever get to Google in the first place. And that's what that's in paid social can be a tremendous accelerant towards, towards getting them there. I think I've got one more question for y'all. And then I want to open it up to questions from the group. Um, and I just want to go back to that point you said about just, you need to have like a blended strategy mm -hmm. and budget. So like, if you only have $3,000, like, how are you spending that strategically in the platform? Like, what are you doing with that money um, to then be the most effective as, as you can be? Great question. Go ahead, Blake. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so let's say you have 3k a month in budget and you got to make something happen with it, right? What I would do if I was in uh, those shoes is um, number one, I'd make sure I had the content ready to put out there, right? Because this targeting people for targeting sake is not going to work, right? If you're just putting anything in front of them. So what I'd recommend is like two things, case studies of successful clients and putting those in front of them. And then like, that's like the number one play. Even if, if you just had one play, people trust their peers. And obviously case studies are a little bit polished. So it's like not as directive as somebody said something to like a community or texted or at a conference, whatever. But people trust their peers. So putting that content in front and then like we talked about the targeting, being as tight as you can. So if you could have a target account list with job titles and case and run case studies to them, that'd be my number one play. And then getting like really tactical, if you're looking at the objectives in LinkedIn, um, typically there's only two I'll really run. One of them is the uh, brand awareness objective, so it's gonna get you the most reach. And the other is website visits. So I would test both. Honestly, in my experience, I would probably use brand awareness just because that's gonna get you the most bang for your buck. Lower CPMs get you as many people as you want to see it. But if you have a really tight audience where it's only a couple people, do the website visits, run the case studies to that really tight a list, have them consume and read the case study, and then just like iterate on that process. But that'd be my like three-step attack at that. Yeah. So I'd, I'll, I'll add some more to that. Uh, I totally agree with the, if you have a small budget, like three grand a month, um, you should be running. I would, I would just, I would default to brand awareness as a play before I even got to website conversions. Yep. Um, the other thing is I would do is, is you'll get the option when it says like, what do you want to optimize for? Optimize for reach hundred percent. Don't optimize for impressions because you want to hit as many people in that audience as humanly possible. Um, one drawback to using brand awareness is it limits you. You only have one bid strategy you can use, which is maximize, uh, spend. Whereas with website visits as an objective, you can try to play with target costs and other stuff in order to, in order to drive, drive clicks down for you. If you have three grand a month, I think some of it also depends on your audience size. If you have a very, if you have a small audience of, if you have a small audience of, let's say 24,000 or something like that, um, you should be probably aiming to run two campaigns simultaneously. I would recommend one case study and one thing around product product marketing. Uh, first off, that'll just let you stretch your frequency out a little bit more and get more spread from your ad uh, or get more get more out of your ad spend. And then at that point, once you kind of built a, a relative list up, I would fire up retargeting uh, at a very small budget, um, probably uh, a little bit down the line after that. But, um, but yeah, I would, I would probably be using brand awareness, brand awareness, brand awareness as objective, looking at running two campaigns simultaneously to the exact same audience that are sort of different stages for you. So, you know, one around the case study is basically funnel, funnel proof. It's like top funnel, mid funnel, bottom funnel. It works everywhere. And then that product marketing key service page sort of thing is more like that mid funnel, uh, sort of content that you'd want to run to them. You could also run problem awareness. And then, um, and then, yeah, just let that, just keep rotating content once you reach a frequency of three, track frequency as a, as a key metric for yourself. And a really good way to think about frequency for me, the, how I think about it, is I always look at like frequency, the frequency versus the spend, and then my target frequency is three. So I'm really just running this little cross multiplication formula to understand like how much money do I need to spend every, uh, how much, how much does it cost me every month to hit my audience 
with the same creative three times. And that lets me know how much creative I need every month for each campaign. So let's say you have $1,500 per campaign um, and it costs you $500 to hit them three times. You're going to need at least three creative for that month to get in front of your audience. Now, creative doesn't mean you're launching new content. You're running the same content to that audience, but you're basically changing the creative out for that content. So they see it in a different way. And, and basically you're telling sort of a different part of that story. So normally what I do is I'll run the same content to my audience for like a quarter or sometimes even longer, but I'll switch out the creative as frequently as I can once it reaches frequency. So I'm keeping it. So I'm keeping a kind of fresh perspective and a fresh twist on it. So they look at it in a different way. Awesome. Great advice. All right. Let's open up for q and There's so much we could still talk about. And I, I imagine that paid social is going to come up again, um, probably multiple times this year on Industrial Marketing Live as, as a topic. So uh, if y'all have questions we don't get to today, we'll use them to influence the future. <laughs> um, so Aaron Drummond asked a question a little while ago. Um, with a combo of changing factors in with in social with third party cookies and the rise in dark social communities, where do you see the future role or value of publisher in the trade space? Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass that one all to you. Could you could, could you repeat that question? Because I know one... Aaron, are you uh, still on here, Aaron? I want to make sure because uh, maybe this would be a good one for you to come on for. Let me look. If we still have Aaron searching for him. All right, we'll skip it. <laughs> we'll skip it for uh, some more clarity. Um, we'll come back. So, I'll, I'll take a look at that uh, afterwards and I'll, I'll, I'll draft up an answer for him. I just, I want to understand a little bit more what I think he's getting at. Go ahead, go yeah, ahead though. For sure. So uh, Will, uh, you brought up um, personal branding being connected to company branding. Ooh. Will, come on, and, let's talk about that. Let's just unmute him. Yeah, I was gonna come say, on, Will. Will. Hello, Will. I don't, I don't like talking on camera. You don't? <laughs> Why not? I like your hat, man. Being, being very facetious. Um, yeah, no, uh, but my question's more along the, um, the personal branding is clearly a, a trend right now. You see it, I mean, in business to consumer and in, uh, in, in business to business, it's just starting to come online. Um, but have you, have you dabbled at all with trying to advertise or use the dollars on a personal brand versus on the company brand and get a better return, I guess is, is my question. We have not got that far with clients yet. Blake may mm -hmm. have a, a better, a better read on that than me. I will say that I don't think it's any accident that most people who do well on paid also have a very strong organic strategy behind it. Mm -hmm. And they complement each other really, really, really well when you do both well, especially when you're both focused on the same channel. So, yeah. you know, when you're both focused on LinkedIn and you're doing this employer branding initiative on LinkedIn, and then you're also running you're also running paid content distribution on LinkedIn to that exact same audience. And you're strategically connecting with people in your, in your total addressable market to make sure people who are participating in that employer brand strategy are getting content in front of those people. Like all those things coalesce into like a really good organic strategy uh, and where the paid really complements it. I would say using the individual uh, would work well on other ad platforms. So let's say you are doing a good job with organic like, let's say, Will, because I, I see you on LinkedIn. Well, I, I know you're active on there. Like, mm -hmm. use yourself in, like, conversation ads or, like, LinkedIn in-mail to go for, like, retargeting the people and go see if you can strike a conversation up with them that way. So mm -hmm. I would use, like, use your own brand to your advantage. I know Nick Bennett from Alice has done that really well, where he's basically using himself as the sender of the message, retargeting yep. people who have visited their website or followed their company page. Um, or maybe they're doing a retarget off of like video ads that they're doing and then essentially using, you know, a known quantity within their company to do that first outreach. And that has been, uh, th that's been really successful for him. So I would say you can take advantage of it, not in like the sponsored content kind of way. I don't think unless you mm -hmm. wanted to do like UGC ads, which I don't yeah. think is a bad idea, but using other sort of ad deliverable methods on LinkedIn where you can take advantage of your personal brand, I think is a great idea. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think you know we're trying to build individual lots of individual employee brands at the same time. So I, I agree with you. We've we've honestly kind of downplayed our efforts on the company page and up tried to raise more individual employees as as content machines. And that's that's been almost more effective for us and it doesn't cost any money. <laughs> no, I mean working really well for you, I would say you have no reason yeah. to, to change off of it. Like, did you have anything you wanted to add to what I said? Yeah, I could add a little bit more color there. Well, I think it's super interesting. Um, what I would add on the personal brand, the organic side, is definitely if you're getting more of your company involved and you're really trying to have that strategy push behind it, I would definitely make sure that you're connecting with the right people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it's like not only are you just like getting engagement with your different employees posts, but like you're getting it in front of the right people and getting that yeah. content in front of the right people. And so yeah. like that's how you can kind of like control that distribution. But I will say an example, a quick example of like using paid to kind of promote a personal brand that I've seen. So the company does a organic LinkedIn execution and they do it really well. Like they've got their uh, team bought in, they've got a good strategy. And what they've kind of done on a couple more of like bottom funnel efforts, if you will, they've like done some things where it's like, you know, in in your case, it might be a pricing request. I don't know, but in in software, right? A demo request to see the software Mm -hmm. work. They've done like the, one of the guys that's really active on LinkedIn did like a little short video, like not high production value, just, you know, a short video where saying like, Hey, come, you know, if if you have questions about our um, software, come talk to our sales team, you know, just get your questions answered. And we used his face and like promoted that. Right. And it's like one of those things where it's like, um, that kind of like really helped like that ad had like crazy engagement on it for a paid ad. And I think it was because he tied that to the organic efforts and people knew him from that, that it was like, Oh, I'm seeing an ad. It's like seeing someone that, you know, even though you've never talked to them. So I think that's, uh, the only example I could think of, but for, in your case, I would probably like, that's like V2 or three. I would just stick with just targeted connections uh, to accelerate it. Yeah. But I mean, Will, like you have a, you have a personal brand as a guy like, like Eddie Saunders, who I I don't know if he's on here right now Mm -hmm. or not, but does the same thing with Flex and Friends. Like, honestly, when you guys are running paid, you you guys are, you guys are the, you guys are the secret weapon for your companies in that regard, Mm because people know who you are. So when you do that kind of Think, almost think of it like I always go back to what B2C brands do, but like like what the guy from Dollar Shave Club did or what the yeah. true commercials that you see on TV right now. The guy's just with this freaking cell phone just filming himself like, hi, I'm XY from Truebill and that's it. Like, you like do those same things on bottom yeah. funnel, like take advantage of the fact that people know your name, they know your face, they kind of know mm-hmm. your style. I mean, it'll be much more effective for you to do an ad like that than maybe having your salesperson do that kind of same thing and you distribute it for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. One thing that I think is important to remember here, though, is that folks are going to click through your ad, and they're going to end up at your company page. So don't forget to post on your company page. Like just because it's uh-huh. not like producing a ton of value, I can't tell you yeah. how many times we click through, and it's like, oh, this company hasn't posted since 2018. Are they legit? You know, like with, with all the spamming and stuff, you got, you got to keep your authority there. They, they don't have a header graphic, but they were paying yeah. for LinkedIn ads. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've clicked on those. Yeah. And you're just like, okay, I was wait, like, what? What, what, what virus did I just get by clicking yeah. on this? For sure. But like, it's a legit company. And uh-huh. uh, yeah. I think it's just a great example of like, you look at how even manufacturing companies, their websites have changed over the mm-hmm. last, you know, five, 10 years. Um, you've got to be legit. You've got to present yourself well. Uh, so don't forget about that. Mm-hmm. Um, we had another question around spend. Um, Do it. What is the minimum monthly spend? This is from Jeremy Johnson, I think. I didn't write down your last name. Sorry, Jeremy, if you're still on here. He is, I believe. Okay, but their LinkedIn budget is around 2000 a month. Um, What's the minimum monthly spend you can you can do and still expect to see results? I have my opinion, but Blake, I want to hear yours first. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking. Um, so I think like minimum spend. I mean, it's a question we get. I'm just like thinking like if it's like 2k or something. Um, basically, what I would do is I would build out your audience. So build out, see like who you're trying to reach, and like you can get some estimates that way. So like you know, say for example. Um, like the example we were talking about earlier, say it's, I don't know, a hundred thousand. And like Matt said, like 20 to 40%, 
that you're actually going to reach. So say you reach, you know, 40% of a hundred thousands, 40,000 people. Well, just, I would just back into it by doing some simple math and saying, okay, if I wanted to reach 40,000 people and the CPMs are, you know, a hundred dollars, how, and I want to, you know, hit them with my content three times during the month. What's my budget for that? Right. And three is just kind of like, it's a guideline, but like, that's where I would start. And then if you can, if you can't get that full budget, which you likely won't be able to, then you can kind of like project out, okay, I'll hit maybe of the actual people that are on there, maybe 30% of them. And then it's also an easier ask if you need to go to your leadership team and say, hey, I can only reach this amount of people with this budget. I know I need to prove this out, but I'm going to need a little bit more to try to even make this work. That's how I think about it. I don't know what you think, Matt. Yeah, I would, uh, I totally agree with that approach. It's something your CFO or your, whoever does your finances at your company will appreciate the kind of like, you know, math that you put into it. Um, I'll give you just a more qualitative feel, in my opinion. I think you need to spend minimum $3,000 a month on LinkedIn in order to get the kind of result that you want in, oh, six-ish months, uh, to be honest. that That's kind of just, that's my feel on it for them. All the companies that I've done it for at, at Gorilla and previously, I, I think, it, I mean, and that that's assuming that your targeting is correct and you're not, you know, going after this enormous audience of like $150,000 with your again a month. Like that's not going to get you, in my opinion, anywhere at all. Um, Blake's way is the right way. Listen, like go, go watch the recording and literally jot his answer down. Um, but if you're asking me qualitatively, what I would say, I would say three grand a month, the minimum you, you, you need to spend and you need to have a requisite audience with that. I mean, we're, we're a pretty big company and we have very tiny marketing dollars and we're, we're not spending much more than that each month. To be really yeah. Frank with you. Um, and that's for all of the Americas, not just the United States. And um, what we've really done is, you know, you have a target audience, you have that persona, but then what we did to try to save ourselves money was who's the actual persona that's online? Because I think a lot of people build a persona of their customer, but then they don't think about that, that customer. Like there's that 50 year old dude who like you, you know, I handed him my QR code last week and he handed it back and said, I don't do the internet. And I, and okay. <laughs> so, I mean, like that dude doesn't need to be in my target audience, right? Like, um, so I think, uh, sometimes we build our persona based upon our customer, but don't think about inside our customer who's actually present on, on LinkedIn or wherever we are, who's actually there. And that can help you. That, that's helped us save a lot of money, to be honest. Yeah, no doubt about that. Awesome. Okay. And then I think to round us out for the hour, we have a a complimentary question from the Aaron, Aaron Weeks and Aaron, how do you pronounce your last name? It's a uh, Burish? Burish. Burish. Right? Yeah, either way. Oh. You want to come on, Aaron? Come Hi. on, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron's one of my clients, so I'm super happy Aaron's coming on. Yeah, so good to have you here. So the question was around um, the correlation of direct traffic and pipeline um, source from direct traffic when that's increasing when you run paid yeah. social. So like, how do you convey that data? Right. Aaron, did I get that right? That was Aaron Weeks's question. Okay. But then we want to talk about like how we talk about that. And that's Aaron Baresh's question. Like, how do you oh, then yeah. translate? Let's that? combine the two. Basically, I think the question Blake and Matt is um, when you got to measure pipeline source from your paid social activity, where do you look? Does it come from the paid social channel? Does it come from direct traffic? Do you mm -hmm. look across your channels to figure that out? So for Erin, she can kind of validate that with, um, you know, her boss. So she has to say, we're spending all this much. What pipeline do we bring in? How do we do it? Yeah. So for me, the core, you'll see a direct correlation in my opinion. And, and from what I've seen, direct traffic to your website from running good paid social. So the instance of the window manufacturing machine company, I'll just use that as an example. Like, you know, what was that? What was I just mentioned? They had like four point four point five million dollars in pipeline over the last nine, uh, over the, the last eight months so far. Uh, that also, they also had a 378% increase in direct traffic. So like, yes, you can clearly see like there's this correlation happening between running good paid social, direct traffic's going way up. 
Um, and we can obviously see these two things running in parallel with one another. So if you're running pay social and it all goes back to targeting and your targeting is correct, you're going to see an increase in direct traffic and it should correlate with an increase in pipeline, um, especially if you look at, at it over a requisite time horizon. It's like, I know in your instance, Aaron, the sales cycles tend to be pretty long, uh, sometimes longer than 12 months. So you may have to wait longer to see all that stuff play out. So give yourself the time and the grace to, to see that sort of see, see those see those measurements play out and, and, and prove it because you're not going to see it after three months and you probably won't even have to see it after six months. But after nine months, 12 months, you're going to probably see something that you're, you're going to see what you're doing and you're going to know if it's effective so long as the targeting is correct. So that would be, that would be my feedback to you there. Uh, Blake, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's a really good summary. Um, I mean, I would just, yeah, you're going to see it in direct traffic um, is like the last touch or branded search. Mm -hmm. um, and potential organic search. Those are gonna be like your top three. Um, you know, it's, it, it is difficult. Like I will like state that, like it's difficult. It can, it can be pretty difficult to get your like, um, you know, executive team to like buy into that methodology, especially if it's a long sales cycle. Cause it's like, you can go six months and it's like, wait, we haven't seen anything. We just spent, you know, 30 K on LinkedIn. We haven't seen anything. So I think it's really just about uh, shifting like shifting their perspective or trying to, right. And trying to like manage up and say, you know, what are we really focused on, um, driving? And so, you know, it's like focused on like those business metrics and then also like for paid social, I think what you're probably doing, but also marrying that with like those high intent channels. So making sure that you have your Google ads in place and potentially like being, if you know, that's a viable channel, those high intent ones that you might get a quicker win, but if you have a 12 month or 18 month sales cycle, like it's like, I think framing that with your CRM data and saying, Hey, our average deal takes this long. Like, even if we got somebody in today, we won't see them closed until this on average. I think kind of framing it using that data is probably going to be your best bet. That's just my take in my experience. Yeah. And I, I would say I have a little inside baseball here. I know you guys run Google ads very profitably so far, Aaron. So you should have some wiggle room to give paid social a chance to play out and do its thing because you obviously have good steady cash flow coming from you guys from, from, from another channel. And honestly, like the paid social should help drive up your paid search as well. Uh, if, if it's getting executed correctly, one other thing that I think that'll correlate aside from direct traffic is also just traffic to your homepage organically. Cause that, that would basically fall under branded organic, but also look at traffic to your homepage over, over that time period too. You should see an increase as well. That would, be, that would be my other kind of take. Awesome. Is that helpful? Yeah. Perfect. Cool. cool. Well, Blake, thank you so much for joining us. I think uh, this is something we'll definitely have to do again uh, in the future. And uh, there's, so, there's so much more to talk about here. Uh, we had an outline that I think we covered covered probably uh, about half of it. <laughs> um, yeah. so, no, but it was a great conversation. It's, it's not, not, a, not a problem at all. And uh, we look forward to the next one. So uh, yeah, Blake, thank you again. Matt, thank you again for sharing your thoughts and for everyone sharing your questions. Uh, we appreciate you and we can't wait to see you on the next uh, Industrial Marketing Live. Yeah, big ups to you, Blake. Thanks so much for coming on. You guys don't know this, but Blake came on on like really short notice. So just really appreciate you taking the invitation and coming on and chatting with us. You have a ton of experience. Really appreciate again your perspective on stuff. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then, you know, if anyone's got any questions, obviously you'll drop it to the team here, but you can find me on LinkedIn, DM me. I'm pretty much an open book. I like to share things. I had a lot of people help me along the way. So if you have any questions, if I can help out in any way I can, please let me know. Cool, cool. Thanks, All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.